Hello, this is Jason Schubach, Director of Design at the National Endowment for the Arts, and welcome to the NEA's webinar series, Creative Placemaking Now. Our town panelists speak about current trends, challenges, and policies. In July 2012, the NEA is hosting three webinars to talk with experts in creative placemaking about current trends, challenges, and policies in the field. These experts all served on the Our Town Program grant review panels. I'm going to start with a brief presentation and then we'll jump into speaking with our panelists for about 30 minutes. That'll leave about 15 to 20 minutes for questions from the public. And I'll tell you in a second about how you can submit your questions. Today, we're gonna to speak about creative placemaking in rural communities. Before I get started, a few housekeeping details. You are all muted and you will only be able to hear myself and the panelists. I will give about a 10 minute PowerPoint presentation, like I said, and then we'll open up for Q&A. During the presentation, you can submit questions at any time using the Q&A box below the PowerPoint. You just type the question in right then. So if you think of one, type it in. It's totally type, fine to type it in while, even while I'm speaking during the presentation. We will also do our best to address as many of those uh, questions as possible during the time we have. Please do not use the raise hand button. This webinar will be posted on our website under the podcasts, webcasts, and webinars section. And it'll be there in a few days, so you can refer to it in the future. So what is creative placemaking? It's when partners from public, private, nonprofit, and community sectors strategically shape the physical social, and social character of a neighborhood, town, tribe, city, or region around arts and cultural activities. While we support creative placemaking at the NEA through a number of different programs and partnerships, Our Town is the agency's primary grant program with the sole focus on creative placemaking. Just a brief reminder that the Our Town grants are partnership projects. They require a partnership between a local government and an arts organization. This partnership is one of the real innovations of these grants. As we've heard from communities all across the country, that the Our Town guidelines have encouraged interesting and fruitful conversations at the local level. In 2011, the first round of Our Town grants funded 51 communities and 34 states. Most of these projects are deep into their work, and we look forward to getting their final reports over the next six months or so to begin program evaluation. In FY12, after reviewing 317 applications, we're funding 80 grants for just under $5 million in 44 states plus DC. In the first two years, we will fund all 50 states plus the District of Columbia, with communities doing creative placemaking from the edge of Alaska to the tip of Florida. I'm going to briefly run through some statistics about this year's Our Town grants. Let's look at some population data. Here's how the grants break down by community size. You'll note there's a mix of communities of all sizes, and five grants are occurring in towns of less than 1,000 people. Including the two required leads, this year's Our Town grants have 566 partners. That's an incredible number and represents the depth and strength of the partnerships that they have in their communities. Of these partners, 192 are arts organizations, 44 are local arts agencies, and four are states arts agencies. When we break down those 192 arts organizations, you can see that we have all disciplines in the grants with theater, museums, visual arts, and multidisciplinary performing arts and visual arts organizations having a large presence. I know you're all asking yourself, who are those other 362 partners on the grants? Well, it's a wide variety of nonprofit organizations, educational institutions at all levels, government agencies from the local, state, and federal level, including the Army, private enterprises, and other organizations like BIDS, Chambers of Commerce, and private philanthropy. The diversity of this list is both amazing and exciting to us. Look at all the different types of organizations who are now contributing to the arts projects in their communities. Finally, let's look at some project types. You'll note that while public art and the design of facilities and public space is still popular among grantees, there's a large number of engagement projects, arts programming, festivals, and performances, for example. Based on our experience last year, 
we decided to do the panel process a bit differently and break the grants into three panels. First, we held a non-metro panel. This panel included applications received from non-metropolitan communities with projects in arts engagement, design, and cultural planning. Next, a design and cultural planning panel reviewed projects from metropolitan communities that are developing the local support systems and places necessary for creative placemaking to succeed. Lastly, we held an arts engagement panel reviewing projects from metropolitan communities where artistic production is the primary method of creative placemaking. As I mentioned before, the non-metro and tribal communities panel included applications received from non-metropolitan and tribal communities with arts engagement, design, and cultural planning activities. After reviewing around 100 of these applications, we gave 27 grants to these communities from all across the country. A community was determined by our Office of Research to be non-metro by both population size and proximity to a metropolitan area. Hence, small suburban communities located within larger metropolitan areas were not included in this panel. The, de the determination to hold this panel enabled small, more isolated communities to compete only against each other and not against metropolitan communities that may have better access to resources. Some examples of project types for funding are the internationally recognized William Inge Festival in Independence, Kansas, expanding its theater festival to the whole town, presenting performances, arts workshops, exhibitions, and concerts in theaters, but also schools, public streets, retail spaces, museums, and libraries. There's also the 15 temporary artworks along a trail in Nevada City, California, cultural district plans for the Santo Domingo tribe, activities in the town of Star, North Carolina to become a center for glass arts, and much more. With that in mind, let's jump into our conversation. First, let me introduce our panelists. Brent Legs is from Boston, Massachusetts. Brent is a field officer at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. He specializes um, in historic preservation and has nearly 10 years of experience working for nonprofit organizations, both as an independent consultant and employee. He works at the intersection of diversity and place. He is also a Loeb Fellow, serves in a, as an advisor to the 17 72 Foundation, and is developing a national vision for the Trust to promote underrepresented, diverse historic places in the United States. Donna Neuwirth is from Reedsburg, Wisconsin. She's the co-founder and executive director of the Worm Farm Institute, a nonprofit organization in Wisconsin dedicated to integrating culture and agriculture. She has a background in art and theater. Through the Institute, New Earth implemented and oversees the artist residency program on a working organic vegetable farm, curates exhibits of fine arts and other curiosities at their, at their Woolen, Mill Gal Woolen Mill Gallery in downtown Reedsburg, and initiated an ongoing project called the Roadside Culture Stands, artist designed and built roadside farm stands. The Worm Farm Institute received the 2010 Wisconsin Governor's Award in support of the arts. Worm Farm is also awarded a 2011 Our Town grant and an Art Place grant for creative placemaking for the uh, annual Farm Art Detour, a 10-day, 50-mile self-guided tour that uses the vision of artists to explore the timeless connections between land and people. Kennedy Smith from Arlington, Virginia, is a principal with the Community Land Use and Economics Group, the CLUE Group, and is one of the nation's foremost experts on economic development planning for older and historic districts. Her work focuses on crafting forward-looking, innovative economic development strategies, then turning them into practical implementation strategies. She's won numerous accolades for her work, including receiving a Love Fellowship at Harvard, being included on Planetizen's list of the top 100 thinkers, and being named one of Fast Company Magazine's Fast Champions of Innovation. So hello, Brent, Donna, and Kennedy. Please say hello to uh, the country. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. We're so pleased you could be with us here today. So we're here to talk about trends, challenges, and policies. Let's start with trends. Kennedy, as a practitioner you've been, who's been working in rural communities across the country, I know you log a lot of miles um, a year. What have you really witnessed um, that may be inspiring or surprising in, in creative placemaking work that's occurring in these smaller communities? Well, I think one of the things that has uh, struck me recently is the diversity of ways that communities are finding to 
um, to financially support creative placemaking. I think that that uh, inherently implies that communities are seeing greater value in it, um, uh, and value in uh, uh, in several ways. One in that uh, creative placemaking helps create a distinctive uh, sense of identity for a community, which has uh, market value, um, and also uh, recognizing that creative placemaking is a, a sort of an efficient uh, an exciting, dynamic way to do community planning. Um, but the thing that I think is a, a really exciting area of innovation that I've been noticing is in how communities are choosing to finance it. They're, they're really creating uh, lots of new partnerships, leveraging resources um, locally and regionally and even nationally uh, to make things happen, uh, getting involved in, in things like crowdfunding um, for key creative placemaking uh, projects, and just looking, I think, more creatively and innovatively at how to make projects really turn into reality. That's great. So let, let's get the artist's perspective. Um, I know you track, you're doing the work locally, Donna, but you're also you know, tracking what's going on nationally. What's, what's really interesting to you right now? What are the trends you're seeing in rural communities who are doing this work with artists? Oh, well, I've noticed this in both our work and, and the work of others, but engagement with communities is really very strong, and not, not in ways we used to see. You know, people doing murals with community input or keeping kids out of trouble using art. Not, not that at all. It feels very new and exciting and more, much more artist-directed and much more contextual. Social engagement itself is the art, and sometimes there's an object or a sculpture or a story or a measurable thing left behind. But the thing of value is the creative engagement itself. Uh, in essence, the artists who work in this way say to the community, this place matters. And ironically, um, it may be spurred by an artist from elsewhere, seeing your town or your community with fresh eyes, perhaps shining a light on its hidden assets. That artist may go away, but the spirit of discovery has been rejuvenated, and creative responses may follow, and artists closer to home may then reveal themselves. Um, our work at Worm Farm at its most basic level is very interdisciplinary in that the arts and farming are intertwined in a variety of ways. Uh, in the context of a working farm, art practice, no matter what the medium is and no matter who the artist is, is in conversation with agriculture. So um, for our work, we look for ways to engage people in one discipline and they may trip over another. Um, they may come to something because of farming and trip over the art, and they become, uh, from an art uh, standpoint, and trip over the farming. And it's the way we all learn and are introduced to new ideas, um, because they're in proximity to ideas we may already hold. Thank you. Uh, Brent, let's get a little bit of your perspective here. I know that um, you work specifically in a lot of diverse communities. What do, what do you see occurring around creative placemaking in some of those communities and uh, in rural communities across the country? Brent, are you there? Yes, I had it on mute, sorry. Uh, the biggest <laughs> trend that I have seen in rural communities is the development of heritage trails. And I think it's one of the most financially sustainable preservation models uh, in play today. It doesn't take a lot of financial resources to sustain over the long term a heritage trail, but communities are identifying cultural resources and interpreting the history behind those uh, historic sites and making that history visible to the public. And for example, there's the Portsmouth Black Heritage Trail in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, historically 4% African-American community. Even today, the, that's similar to what the, uh, the demographic is. But they identified 28 historic sites around their rural community uh, related to African-American history. And it has really become, really become something that has um, brought more cultural awareness, about their history and about the place and made the locals more aware of the, the history in the community. So I think that's the, the, the trend that I'm seeing when it comes to underrepresented communities. I'm glad you brought up kind of cultural tourism and heritage tourism. Um, I remember the panel was very excited about the project in Kinston, North Carolina, um, and uh, which is an African-American music heritage trail in that community. I mean, and of course, Donna, your, your, your tour um, 
that you did in uh, the, the farm tour that you do, and it's sort of a one version. Of that. Let's dig into this issue just a little bit. Can you what what excited you? about the Kinston project. Um, what, what was unique? What were the unique aspects of it that made it a great project? Well, I thought, one, I loved, of course, supporting the financial sustainability of the model uh, was great. It also showcased, again, this kind of underrepresented history. It was a real beautiful story. People can identify with music. I mean, who doesn't love music? And, and blues, and it had something that the broader community could identify with. Uh, but it was also the kind of social aspect. I mean, it was really bringing together people within the community that had roots there, but they also had this kind of collaborative partnership that brought together uh, people from outside of that community. And again, it kind of used place to uh, uh, instill a, a new kind of cultural mindset about uh, their cultural identity uh, in Kingston. I thought it was a great project. Donna, why don't you jump in here a little bit and talk about how you've been implementing your tour and what are some of the ins and outs that, that were unexpected? Oh, well, um, it's truly an interdisciplinary project. So it's involving farmers and artists and landowners and uh, and musicians and chambers of commerce in the county and the land conservation people. So it was a way to kind of take another look at the place where we live and shine uh, a light on its assets and its agricultural heritage is, is that one. And because of this moment in history with the local food movement being so exciting and sexy now, it's, it's a way for us to take this moment in time and leverage it uh, with the assets that the community already has. So it gets people excited about it, um, not for necessarily from the arts point of view, but from the fact that we're celebrating um, our own actual authentic history. And then the arts are the punctuation that sort of help us tell that story. And so I think it was something that just came together at the right place at the right time and um, has generated lots of excitement because everyone can find their place in it. And that's what I really love about the phrase creative placemaking, because sometimes in rural areas, the A word is not necessarily helpful. Art sometimes can make people back away because they think maybe they're, it's not for them. But creative placemaking is welcoming, and um, everyone seems to be able to find their place within it. Well, Kennedy, you've done a lot of work um, around cultural heritage tourism also. And what are the kind of policies you see that governments kind of need to have in place to make some of this make some of this work happen? Are there funding mechanisms? Are there zoning mechanisms? And what are, what are the tools people are using to do this, some of this work in communities? Well, you know, I, I always look at things, uh, you know, beginning with the perspective of a downtown. Most of my work has been in downtown uh, economic development and downtown revitalization. And so many things have happened over the past half century or so that have really affected um, how downtowns function um, that I think one of the first things I, I usually do is to take a look at the policies that are impeding growth. Um, because many of those policies have been put in place in the past half century. Some of them are zoning uh, policies. Uh, for example, if um, you know if a community's downtown has a relatively high vacancy rate, but the zoning code is allowing new commercial development to take place outside the downtown when there's vacant you know vacancy downtown, um, that's sort of a poor outcome. That's not what the community probably really intended to have happen in its zoning. Um, same thing with uh, with uh, zoning policies that impede mixed uses in downtowns, being able to have ground floor retail and then upper floor offices or housing or, um, or other kinds of uses, um, or have diversity of uses within a town center. We, we sort of gravitated towards zoning that separates out uses in communities. Um, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, and sometimes the zoning codes that we have in place uh, are barriers to making that happen now. So I think one of the, one of the first things to do is to sort of just take a, a scan of what are the policies uh, that are really driving development in a community now and driving uh, creative placemaking. Um, and are those, are those really consistent with what we're trying to achieve in creative placemaking? So I think that environmental scan is kind of the first thing to do. 
Right, and so that might play out in ways where you know, do you can you even have artists working temporarily in a down in a, maybe in a downtown empty storefront? Does the law even allow that to happen? So those are maybe some things for communities to look at. All right, let's talk money. Everyone's favorite topic. So, um, Donna, you're the real practitioner on the ground, actually doing this work. How have you pieced together the money to do the work that Worm Farm has been doing around creative placemaking? Where does it come from? Well, we do it probably like every tiny nonprofit, I imagine, you know, individual and foundation support and little earned income and sponsorships. But we do rely heavily on grant funding, which has been critical in our work over the past 10 years. Uh, we are incredibly fortunate to live in the only rural county in the state of Wisconsin with an arts and humanities granting program. It's a small one, but it's very effective. Uh, through rural, uh, the rural and economically challenged both the arts and sustainable agriculture are valued where we live. And as a result, our programs have evolved slowly over time and have matured enough to be ready to apply to the NEA uh, just last year. So the, the Our Town grant last year was our first application to the endowment. And receiving it has brought uh, an ambitious and multifaceted vision to life. It, it, it opened doors for us in ways just too numerous to mention. And I can't encourage people enough to kind of take it slow and work your way up to it. Um, uh, since we've received the Our Town grant, we've also received um, Art Place grants. In fact, we were one of only two in the country to receive second year funding from Art Place, which is also creative placemaking. So this has been um, uh, an incredible opportunity for us. And uh, the, the structure of, of the Our Town grants with a strong government partner made it possible for us to be able to pull this off. Um, if we didn't have that, it would have been too big for us to manage. Um, so um, through, through the Our Town project, we've made important connections in, in addition to, to, to resources, um, financial resources. We've made important connections with both state and national leaders at USDA um, exploring new ways to address rural development. Engagement has been broad and deep from individual artists engaging with the landowners along the actual detour to Worm Farm engaging with federal and state agencies across disciplines. Uh, I mean, it's just been remarkable, and it's, it continues. And uh, I think a part of it is seen on this panel today. It's just opened up worlds for us that, um, that were not possible before. Um, it's also enabled us to attract other funders who uh, may be able to support us um, as we try to build capacity to keep these efforts going. Um, I guess uh, anybody, uh, and I think this is probably an important thing to point out, um, that anyone who gets uh, an Our Town grant, especially if they're a small rural organization, it is rather a windfall. And we don't want it to be a one-off. So we have to use the, um, the partners and the, and the collaborators to help build a sustainable and, and, and uh, a sustainable event that can grow over time and really reap the economic development uh, awards that our town is intending to, to do. So with new friends and new funders and new attention, um, we are working very hard to make that happen. Great. Well, that's that's useful, I think, for people who are talking about doing some of the, the arts programming that you're doing. Let's talk a little bit about um, facilities uh, and, and buildings in some of these smaller communities. I remember Kennedy was very enthusiastic about many um, of the opportunities for bringing back or bringing in uh, new downtown, sort of restoring theaters in downtowns um, as an opportunity as for creative placemaking. How do you see a lot of communities piecing together this funding? And I want Brent and Kennedy to, to jump in here, really. What are, what are the resources for um, folks to bring these facilities back in communities? Well, I, you know, I, I would say first and foremost, the historic rehabilitation tax credits and in communities where uh, the downtown area or the area where the theater is is uh, eligible for federal new markets tax credits, um, coupling those with the historic rehab credits. I've seen, I don't know, over the past five or ten years, probably 20 or 25 downtown theater rehab projects take place um, that would not have happened if not for the, uh, the, the ability to use the tax credits. Um, so that's a, that's a, big, a big thing. Um, tax increment finance, even in really tiny communities, has also helped out um, in some instances with theater rehab um, 
you know, basically uh, recognizing that because the, the property will be more valuable once it's been rehabbed, the local government um, dedicates the, the increment of new tax revenue that it will get, property tax revenue, um, for use to help assist the project. So it can basically bond that tax increment um, over a period of 20 years uh, and then invest the funds up front. Um, I think with theater projects in particular, um, one of the things that I think is always important is to recognize that there are people who really like historic theater buildings and want to preserve and uh, restore them and get them in operation again. And then there are people who really like to put on shows. <laughs> and um, they, they aren't necessarily the same kinds of people. And each of those groups, they sort of come together around theater rehab projects um, and they each have their own networks of potential funding sources and their own and their own financing skills um, in two completely different worlds. So it's really important to get both of those groups um, on the same page at the table together and thinking about how to um, how to piece together the financing. But certainly, historic rehab credits and new markets credits um, can really make a project happen by providing you know 20, 30, 40 percent of the equity needed uh, for the project, depending on. Um, its eligibility and whether there's a state historic rehab credit in place as well as a federal uh, historic rehab credit. And just to uh, why don't you jump in a little bit? Yeah, just yeah. add to um, what other resources do you guys have? to uh, uh, Kennedy's comment and and Kennedy just talked really at a, a kind of high level, sophisticated, you know, kind of financial approach. But I, I think that folks should also think about. Uh, maximizing their local intellectual capital. Kind of think about uh, this as a planning process because what you want to do is evaluate your vision, you, whatever the idea is that you're proposing. And so I would suggest that you seek the advice of a trained professional, somebody that's within the broader field of maybe the arts or those that help to kind of shape our cities. So you might want to uh, identify a historic preservation professional, an architect, or a planner. You know, their work basically is to help to make communities more vibrant and lively, and they're constantly looking at how the, the landscape or historic resources, you know, the buildings, how they, you know, help, again, to rebrand, create a new identity for uh, communities. And I would also try to uh, not think so much about creating a brand new model, but try to identify someone that can help you find existing models. You know, these architects and planners and preservations, we see cutting edge examples and models of great place making projects that you could mimic or just, you know, build upon. Uh, and I think that's probably, you know, what I want to offer is, is really to try to maximize the intellectual capital in your community. I think that's a great suggestion, and let's let's talk a little bit about the importance of partnerships. As you saw in my presentation, there's all kinds of partners, everything from religious institutions to aging service organizations to you name it. We're really on these grants, which I think was very exciting to us, and we did have discussions in the panel about that. Donna, what, how has the need for partnerships played out locally? Who were the kinds of folks that showed up, um, and how did that build? Who was unexpected? Um, who have you been talking to you never thought you'd be talking to? And how has that played out? Give us, give us some of how that works in, in your community. Hmm. Well, I mean, we started with our partner, the county, Salt County, which has the arts and culture uh, granting program. But they also, um, within it, have uh, UW Extension. And that has the, um, the 4-H clubs and the uh, HCE, which is Home Community Educators. And so you have the kind of um, those, those service groups involved from the beginning, and, but they're connected with the county and the county government. So it sort of strengthens that partnership. And then the arts, which were um, uh, not necessarily cohesive, but because of our work uh, with culture and agriculture and having an artist residency program on our farm, um, we had a history of having programs that sort of um, that sort of partnered those things in in the public square. So we had a series of puppet festivals that focused on the funny farm, and we had classes and workshops and speakers. So we had made inroads in 
in that in the past. And so then we would get, as I said earlier, people coming for the farming and tripping over the art and coming for the art and tripping over the farming. So we thought it was very important to not label what we do as one thing, that we're doing creative activities that people may find interesting. And I think the detour is a, um, a great example of that. It is a country, it's a drive through beautiful country roads where you will see a variety of things. And we think the power of um, contemporary artists doing installations in the middle of the fields is that it slows people down and they notice the, the land itself as our cultural resource. So I think it's, it's um, the fact that people recognize that we really do care deeply about farmers and farmland and farmers making a living in cheese factories and small mom and pop operations and we can bring people, we can bring people from nearby cities through these small towns where of course they buy lunch and they go shopping <laughs> and they do a variety of things but it's the excuse of the art installations and the field notes that brings them out on the drive. And so what they end up having is this kind of um, um, multifaceted experience with arts at its core. Um, so because of that, we have the Chamber of Commerce, and we have farmers, and we have zoning people. In fact, zoning, we, we were actually afraid of the zoning people for, the, for um, reasons that Kennedy mentioned earlier. We thought that sometimes it's better to uh, uh, beg forgiveness than ask permission. But we had people on our team that cared deeply about the land and cared deeply about having people come out and see working lands um, still active and thriving. and. Uh, so they helped us instead of pre uh, presented a barrier to us. And you know, this is still relatively new, so we're still picking up partners and um, still surprised at how many people connect on this on, on um, a variety of levels. So that's great. Kennedy, what about the role of the local political leaders? Um, you know, they are forced partners on the R Town grants, but generally, if someone just wants to do a creative placemaking project in some of these communities, how, how do you see the political, local political leadership engaging? What's good ways to approach them? What's the right ways to engage them? Let's, can you talk a little bit about some of your experience working with local political, political leadership across the country? Um, well, you know, I think that communities that are uh, that are are engaging in creative placemaking are probably, um, you know somewhat ahead of the curve on partnerships in that they've probably, you know, already sort of gotten a good a good working partnership with their local government, um, which is uh, a good thing. And I think what local government can really bring to the table um, is uh, the role of convener. They can be the one who, you know, uses uh, influence to bring people together. Um, and also, uh, you know, creative problem solving. And as I said earlier, there are often a lot of barriers to good design in communities and adaptive use of buildings and good development. Um, and I think good enlightened local leadership, uh, government leadership, uh, can play a critical role in helping um, uh, break through some of those barriers. Um, I think they also have a really important leveraging role to play. Um, I've seen a lot of communities where local government may take the lead, for instance, in um, in a downtown setting, for example, in offering to uh, to do public improvements, to improve sidewalks, to install uh, better street lighting, uh, you know, do uh, you know better uh, set of wayfinding uh, uh, systems and things, um, but not necessarily uh, asking the the uh, the private sector to respond in kind. Um, and I think that. Uh, it's better ultimately if the local government can use its role uh, as a leverager and work with private sector property owners, business owners, community group civic organizations, um, artists and art organizations uh, to sort of do a you know a something in tandem and offer uh, municipal help in exchange for uh, private sector activity. That's great, Brett. Let's talk a little bit about the the public outreach process in these projects. I mean, how do you guarantee that you're getting the right people at the table to accomplish this, the project in the correct way? I mean, that's something we talked a lot about in, in the panel was, um, you know, do they have the kind of right outreach plans to actually reach the communities they want to reach and do the work that they want to do? How do, you, how do you see that work being done successfully locally? And maybe give a couple examples. Hmm. Well, I. Uh... I would suggest first, it's it's always about forming the right team, and again, kind of going back to this 
this kind of planning process before you, you know, submit your pro grant proposal. It's about forming a team of intellectual uh, folks with intellectual capital in your community that can help you brainstorm and consider an outreach plan that would be effective. So one strategy is, of course, local media. And uh, uh, again, going back to Portsmouth Black Heritage Trail, uh, the way that they promoted that they were starting a historic marker program, that they were engaging artists to design the historic marker program, was to get the local paper to run a, a series of articles about the history. And they started to engage the property owners at the historic site. So the actual article uh, uh, showcased the historic property owner. Sometimes they don't get enough you know, credit for helping to save history. But then it interpreted the site as well and then talked about the artist uh, that was designing the historic marker. So I thought that that was really creative, low cost, innovative way to uh, reach out to the community and to uh, to gain some support behind their project. And then the, the same thing happened with the African burial ground there. Uh, it was recently uh, discovered uh, through a, a, a construction project to improve the, the streets. And they've been able to, again, use the media to develop an outreach plan uh, that engaged a lot of artists. They ended up developing a um, uh, design competition that brought more visibility to their project. Uh, they had artists from all around the country to then submit proposals. And again, that was just a great way for them to gain additional visibility and for more people to know about their project. And it also helped them to attract artists and other people to the project that they never would have been able to engage. That's great. I'm going to ask a couple more questions of our panelists, but if people want to go ahead and start typing in some questions into the Q&A box, we can, um, we'll have some of those li lined up for when uh, we wrap up with our conversation in the next um, eight, or eight minutes or so. Um, I want to come back to arts activities and really uh, festivals, temporary arts engagement activities. Donna, what role have you really seen those playing in improving the livability of your community? How people reacted to it? What's been the kind of overall effect that you've seen? And what, what's kind of worked and what hasn't? And, you know, I know one of the things we very much emphasize is the role of local assets, that this shouldn't be just someone coming in with a crazy idea that a bit, although that sometimes works, but a lot of the times it really should be quite reflective of what happens and is happening in a community. Um, talk a little bit about how you've used temporary arts events in your work and what the impacts would be. Where, how, how you've worked off your local assets to do that and really what the impacts that you see happening are. Well, we, we had done a, a variety of uh, public art activities preceding the, the Farm Art Detour uh, puppet festival every year, uh, every year for four, four years where we made giant puppets out of recycled materials and got kids engaged in um, in a big parade and uh, week-long puppet making festival so and that was very very well received and again it was kind of creative activity that didn't necessarily have to use the a word it was just this fun um, fun festival that was hands-on and then uh, actually kind of used the recycling theme to sort of teach a lesson so we, we knew, um, and festivals are, are an ancient and eternally, yet eternally new venue for transforming your street or your park or your town into a magical place. And, and it's the very temporariness that gives it power. I mean, you, you see the place anew. It comes alive with music or theater or interactive installations or fireworks or interventions or giant puppets or acrobatic feats. And then the festival packs up and goes away. Um, we think that that's been remarkably effective. Uh, it wakes up dormant curiosity, and it has the power to ignite the imagination. Um, and it also doesn't kind of permanently alter the town, where people, where you can um, sidestep the uh, the skeptics, because it's this short burst of creative activity that can leave sort of a fertile space in its wake for more fertile activity. And we've truly found that to be true. Um, 
it, it's, uh, it can be embraced by a broad audience, and people experience the art on their own terms without a cultural gatekeeper. Uh, it's also a natu really natural fit for agricultural communities, as they are often festivals are often seasonal celebrations tied to fertility and the harvest. Um, ours certainly are. Uh, the earliest known art forms were born of such rituals. And inviting contemporary artists to return for a moment to explore and celebrate that timeless connection between land and people can leave in its wake a, a kind of permanent value. Uh, we're also near Baraboo, Wisconsin, which has the Circus World Museum. And, and like the circus trains that came through here, again, tied to our local history uh, 100 years ago, the elephants and the trapeze artists pack up for the next town, but they leave in their wake all kinds of possibilities and awakened imaginations. So we have found it to be kind of exhilarating and, um, and also allowing for new relationships and collaborations to form in their wake. Great. Um, let's talk a little bit about the importance of place, I mean, since we're focusing on local assets. And I know one thing that came up a lot in the review process was, where is the work actually going to take place in the community, a certain site? How important is that, Kennedy? Um, you know, what, what's the, what, how important is the actual place within these communities where a lot of this work happens? Wow. Well, um, that's a that's a big question with a, a lot question. of different answers. But I think that um, uh, that one thing is that you you know again it's sort of a question of leverage. You want to be able to um, uh, to do something that may have a catalytic impact on stimulating other sorts of creative activities within the community, other kinds of development. Um, you may want to use uh, creative placemaking as a way to sort of heal places that have um, physically become dysfunctional over time and aren't uh, aren't serving as well as they uh, as they might have. I've seen communities do uh, just amazing things with uh, little parcels of land or intersections that um, may had you know, um, maybe had some function at one point in the past and now do something else. I came across a couple of years ago a music park where. Uh, because of the wind direction kind of blowing across this parcel of land, somebody in the community got the idea of putting a couple of blowing rocks there and some chimes and making this incredible music park where you heard this great, these great sounds uh, created by nothing except uh, you know, wind in the natural environment. Um, so I think that uh, taking a look at where you can have a great impact in terms of uh, catalyzing new activity or uh, taking a look at places that need a little bit of extra attention um, in order to make them function better uh, is a good way to start. And then, of course, the great thing about creative placemaking is that there's, you know, the word creative is there, and there are so many different directions that this can take place in. Um, I'm obviously, uh, you know, a strong advocate for uh, for reusing uh, existing buildings, um, and I think that. Uh, again, taking a look at the great building structure, uh, the great building heritage that we have in place in so many communities, uh, and finding a way to make those existing historic resources work work best um, is always a good place to start. That's great. Well, we've got some great questions coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and jump to those before so we have enough time uh, to give you guys sort of the final word. Um, here's a good one. This is probably directly for Kennedy. Are there some good models of zoning approaches that restore mixed use zoning with minimal disruption and conflict? Well, um, yeah, there are, and you know, actually, one of the sort of biggest uh, trends out there, I would say, now in in uh, in sort of zoning reparations, is um, is the adoption of form based codes, uh, which are you know, as opposed to use based codes, which is what many communities have in place now. Uh, it's called Euclidean zoning. Um, that separates out uses. Form-based codes instead focuses on the physical form uh, of buildings and places, um, and in essence takes the entire community through uh, a design process of making decisions about how they want the physical environment to look uh, and perform. Um, and so that those values become uh, part of the code. And most form-based codes are overlay codes. So in essence, someone who wants to improve a building, build a new building, um, renovate a building can either sort of go with the form-based code, in which case their their development project is usually kind of zips through pretty quickly because the community has already hashed out many of these issues. Or if they want to do something that doesn't quite conform with that, then they can go to the underlying zoning um, and go through the regular approval process. Um, but form-based uh, zoning is just a, a completely different way of looking at 
uh, how to make these work. And because they're overlays, it really does involve uh, sort of a minimal level of disruption um, for the community in terms of its processes. And it's a great sort of process for the community because it gets everybody talking about how they want the community to, uh, to look uh, and perform and evolve. That's great. Thanks so much. Um, uh, here's one for Donna. Um, it says, you've mentioned several times avoiding the A word. Of course, we like the A word here at the <laughs> National Endowment for the Arts. But um, uh, here they're asking, they have an art gallery in a small town, and they really struggle to get the people through the door. I know you also run an art gallery in a small town. What are, what are some of the things you do to both reach out to the community through that gallery and also get some people through the door? Well, we change it up a lot. We, we experiment. Um, we consider ourselves more of a laboratory than a gallery. And uh, our most recent incarnation, we call our gallery Fine Art and Curiosities. And so we tend to mix things up. If we have a show of um, a printmaker, we'll also have uh, concurrently a taxidermist. Um, we will have a collection of hubcaps with, with uh, uh, some sculpture. We will really mix it up. And again, kind of drawing different kinds of people together. Because once people are in the room, you know, humans are curious people. And once they feel comfortable, they're, they're um, interested. And uh, the thing that um, we've, I, as, as I've said before, we've struggled with this for years. Because we get very, very excited about the things that we're doing. And we want to share that excitement. So we try different avenues to um, get people excited. And, or to find out what excites people. So we tried very different things. And um, we found that the word gallery is not necessarily helpful either. Laboratory is more helpful. Um, because what we're really after is um, people um, tend to be uh, interested in the creative output, uh, uh, the output of a creative mind, whether it's somebody who puts together uh, an unusual collection or someone who makes sculpture or writes poetry. I think people do engage with those activities. It's just sometimes these, these structures um, in small towns um, keep them away. So I would say just experiment with different uh, names. Instead of calling it art or gallery, try a few other, other words. Um, this is a good one for Brent. Uh, we're a community who submitted an art application, uh, and it was f it was the first time we applied for federal funding. In your experience working with smaller communities across the country, can you think of any organizations or resources that might help a small nonprofit organization or a small town government put together a strong project? Yeah, I uh, I can, and uh, yeah, well, what I would suggest is probably uh, uh, going to the. Small Business Association. They definitely can help with grant writing or identifying a grant writer if that is needed. Uh, also speaking with uh, academic institutions, a lot of times they, you know, it's a whole entire campus of intellectual capital across many different disciplines, you know, from uh, those uh, based in the arts, so that's uh, the School of Music, uh, School of Theater, School of Arts, so desi design schools, but then also business schools, because a lot of uh, the projects have a real strong business component. Uh, history organizations in their various forms, so preservation organizations uh, are fantastic resources as well. And again, it's also trying to identify, if you're brand new, trying to identify a project, uh, a vision, and being able to evaluate that vision so that your proposal can compete as strongly as you want it to. And so you really want to talk to experts and professionals that can help, again, kind of assess and evaluate uh, your project. Great, thank you. Uh, Kennedy, let's, let's give this one to you. What are the effective ways to establish partnerships with local government officials who are currently on board? Um, should you make academic arguments for economic development through the arts, focus on community development? This person lives in a small town that has a university and other cultural assets, but the government and economic development office is stuck on attracting traditional art agricultural industries. <laughs> um, gosh. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think, I mean, there are, there are probably, you know, some sort of global tactics, but what I think it really comes down to is that every, every local government leader is probably motivated by something 
uh, unique to them. You know, for some it's going to be economic development, they want to create jobs. Uh, for others, it might be a legacy. For some, it might be you know growing the community. Whatever it is, I think it's important to figure out what that person's hot button is, and um, and then find a way to shape the argument. The the amazing thing about creative placemaking is that there are a gazillion reasons why it's a good why it's a good approach for communities and for community development. Um, and I think it just takes really tailoring it to to that perspective. Most local government officials that I've come in contact with are obviously pretty pretty heavily motivated by economic development, particularly in the past five or six years um, since the economic downturn. Um, and I think that you can usually find some pretty compelling arguments there. Um, one of the ones that I've seen uh, local government officials respond to recently is talking to them a little bit about um, uh, millennials, the people who are between roughly 16 and 35 years of age right now, um, who really are sort of thinking about communities and thinking about how they're going to work uh, and live in very different ways from their parents. Um, they're growing up, in essence, in a sort of you know virtual global community uh, and looking for uh, placemaking, for places that resonate with them um, as a sort of corollary to that. And so they're thinking about places in a different way than their parents might have for their parents that might have been driven by economic opportunities. This generation knows that they can create their own economic their, their own economic opportunities online in many cases. Um, and many of them believe that they will you know, sort of have their own businesses and create their own destinies uh, professionally um, at some point. So I think that just beginning to open government officials' eyes to here's a generation that has a lot of buying power that's beginning to come down the pike. Um, they're creating a lot of jobs. They're creating a lot of businesses. Um, and the places that they like to live and work are places that are uh, compact, that have a strong sense of place and identity, uh, that have a lot of creative energy uh, that's going to feed their work. Um, and I found that that is resonating more and more with local government officials who may be thinking in more traditional ways about a market that is now aging, and they're not, they're not tapping into the younger one, especially in rural areas, I think, where a lot of communities have lost population because younger people graduate from high school and they leave town. They go to college or they move away for a job. Those people are, are looking to come back to, uh, to communities, to smaller communities, um, because the opportunities exist now for them in a different way. That's great. And we also have a great suggestion um, from online uh, that there are state arts agencies and local and local and county and regional arts agencies that can also be help helpful to you or to arts and arts groups looking to get started in creative placemaking. So those are also pl great places to reach out to. You should be able to find that pretty easily just by typing in your state or your local or, local or regional um, area and just uh, saying arts agency. You should be able to find that through Google. If you can't, you can always contact the endowment and we'll guide you right to them. Um, Donna, here's a, somewhat of a provocative one for you. What is really the role of an individual artist um, in, in helping their communities really sort of confront and strategize about change or revitalization, especially in, in some of the smaller communities? What what is your role as an artist really been? Um, where have you found yourself in that conversation? Oh, that's, that's a tricky one. Um, it's been a very long and gradual process. Um, and I think sometimes the artist or, or an artist is an irritant in a, in a community, not necessarily welcome, <laughs> but maybe tolerated. And then over time, accretions can form that uh, may turn that irritant into a pearl, as it does with an oyster. But I think it takes a long, long time. And it's only looking back on what it has done for a, a community that that, uh, that difference, um, that irritant, might be embraced. So I think. Um, I think that, that we have, over time, um, kind of plugged away and been persistent and fed our need to um, have other artists around and create um, uh, exciting activity uh, at the intersection of culture and agriculture. We've been persistent, and um, it has finally um, paid off in a way that people can see that it has um, wonderful things that can attach themselves to it. It brings bodies. Bodies go to restaurants and go to bars and drop money. So I think the economic development and the creative placemaking concept fit very, very well. Um, I think in a smaller town, it, it is harder because um, the um, 
the arts community is more spread out. I mean, what, I, what we've come to realize is that the percentage is probably about the same in a rural community as it is in urban, but we have to get a, in a car to drive three miles to get, to get together, perhaps, whereas in the city it's a, it's a subway stop. It's a subway ride. So I think we uh, try to, to find uh, ways to talk to each other and pull people in to create uh, interdisciplinary partnerships. And I think it's only now that we have had a couple of successful events that people who did not pay much attention before are saying, hmm, the arts are an important piece of the strategy. And so I think we're there now. Uh, I don't think we were there a few years ago. So I think it's persistence, and I think it's timing, and I think the creative placemaking um, concept uh, just works very, very well for rural communities that are looking to sort of piece things together. Um, uh, in, in our case, the local food movement has sort of revitalized some of these efforts. And I think it's also important to point out, at least for us, we are rural and isolated, but we are also um, in the middle of three major metro metropolitan areas. Um, and we provide food for them all. And so this, this uh, new interest by urban people in where their food comes from has, has uh, enabled us to tap that curiosity and do some really interesting things. That's great. Well, we're going to go with last words here. Um, Kennedy, I'm going to call on you first. Any last bits of advice or overall impressions you had from being on the Our Town panel about uh, how to do this work well in rural communities, or what things you saw, what things or trends you saw that were were um, very interesting to you, and that might be interesting to the American public. Uh, gosh, uh, I think that you know, again, it goes back to partnerships. I think that we saw some pretty uh, unique and innovative partnerships uh, in the applications that we reviewed. Um, and in general, I think the more the more people who are involved who are um, involved and on board for a project. Uh, the more likely it is to succeed and the stronger it's going to be. Um, I notice that there seems to be sort of an innate uh, uh, sort of preference or leaning uh, towards um, creative placemaking in, uh, you know, sort of compact mixed use uh, town centers and neighborhoods and communities, sort of a, um, an awareness that, uh, that that's where there's, you know, a lot of energy and activity where historically a lot of creative placemaking has taken place. Um, and that really represents, when you think about it, a pretty fundamental shift uh, from where we were as a nation 30 or you know, 40 years ago, um, and a really, good, a really good step in the right direction. I think there's also sort of an awareness that came through in the applications that resources are more limited now, uh, at least traditional resources uh, that, that might have been there uh, for doing community development work 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and communities are becoming more resourceful. I think that uh, small rural communities have always had to be very resourceful. Um, and in that way, I think that we saw some, uh, some extraordinarily creative applications emerge um, from this round of communities really sort of using that experience they've had of trying to make things work in new and innovative ways um, at a new level now for creative placemaking. Great. Thank you. Brent? Yeah, I think uh, the power of, of the arts to help create a new identity and to rebrand communities. A lot of rural communities struggle with being relevant in some kind of way and, uh, uh, and also trying to attract heritage tourism dollars and, and become economic, you know, thrive economically again. And so I, I saw in the, the proposals this consistent theme of how history intersects with the arts and combined they can make places relevant and vibrant and really, really cool. And that's either saving a historic building and using it as an arts venue or uh, having some kind of public art component that, again, kind of brings a new identity to uh, a place. I also was inspired and encouraged that uh, a lot of the uh, proposals were trying to engage young adults and the youth in the arts. And so a lot of the programming, uh, uh, again, tried to engage that audience. So overall, I felt that uh, 
there were so many fantastic proposals. I can't iterate enough what uh, was said earlier that partnerships were really strong. We saw some collaborations and almost mergers of organizations working together. They had been within close proximity of one another for years and never even had you know, kind of conversations about how they can maximize their economies of scale and, and collaborate. And I thought that was um, something that you all should keep in mind. Donna, last word. Oh, uh, what was the question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just any uh, impressions or takeaways about how to do the work effectively that you haven't spoken about yet, or any sort of big trends that you got excited about within the uh, applications themselves that you might thought thought might be worth kind of pointing out to folks. Well, yeah, but on the um, webinar. There, um, from the applications again, yeah. To repeat what everyone else has said, there were some remarkable uh, and quite a a diverse group of applications. Uh, there were some that excited me personally that, that really did a lot with um, science and the arts or agriculture and the arts and really mixed it up. Um, and I see a couple of those. Um, in our particular group, we reviewed them all. So we got the ones that were re restoring the theaters as well as the arts engagement ones. So it was tricky to compare apples to oranges. Um, it was a remarkable process to go through. And I would also um, encourage anyone who would like to learn more about this process to, to engage in the, in the panel process. It was quite enlightening for me. And I'm very grateful for the NEA for their support of our work and for teaching me so much about how this happens around the country. Well, thanks so much. Um, thank you to our panelists. Uh, we're giving you a round of applause, a silent round of applause here. <laughs> um, it really is an exciting time for the evolution and exploration of the creative placemaking field. Um, we're pretty certain that these invest, the investments we're making will bear fruit in their communities and lessons for the field as a whole. Again, I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank all of you for joining us on this webinar. We will absolutely um, uh, continue to follow up on these issues, continue to investigate these issues uh, in many different ways. Uh, the, the next thing we're going to be doing is actually having another uh, webinar next week um, that will be focused on metropolitan uh, communities, uh, talking about specifically about design and cultural planning. Then the following Tuesday, um, we'll be talking about creative placemaking and arts engagement. There's, there's uh, public art and uh, temporary arts programming activities. So please join us for those too. Um, tell your friends, tell your parents. <laughs> and uh, thanks so much. This is the NEA signing out.